Here we go. Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Julie Mann. I'm a professional network marketer, an actor, and also an EFT practitioner. And I'm ever so excited because today I'm joined by Tiffany Armstrong. Hi, Tiffany. Hey, how's it going? So excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you because your story is just crazy. But anyway, I want to start really with the fact that firstly, you do a number of different things. But one of the things we're going to kind of focus on is the fact that you're now a self-defense educator. Yeah. I am. I oh. am for 22 years. <laughs> oh, 22. OK, so before we start talking about that, I just really want to touch on your childhood. Let's talk mm -hmm. about when you, you know, what life was like as you were growing up. Absolutely. It was uh, definitely full of turmoil and so many lessons to be learned from it. But when I was growing up, I was sexually abused by three different uh, men for a 10 year period. And there was just a lot of psychological abuse going on in my family as well with my mother. And uh, it was uh, it was difficult in the fact that I never felt like I had a um, a safe place to be. You know, not only was my home and my house invaded with just the abuse, but also my home, my physical home. And so I never felt safe in my own body. I never felt safe in my own home. Um, and with that is very fascinating that um, I ended up becoming a severe people pleaser because, and that affected the rest of my life. Um, but I became a severe people pleaser because other people approving of me or, you know, my soul, my soul survival depended on other people. And so, so much sexual abuse that was happening on a regular basis. And uh, I just felt lost. And I felt like I was put on this earth for other people's benefit, pleasure, and put on this earth for other people to um, have their emotional needs taken care of. Uh, because I was dependent on to be my mom's emotional crutch from five years old on. And uh, if I didn't give her that emotional security, even at five years old, she would completely uh, lose it and, uh, you know, do horrible things. So it was uh, quite the, you know, quite the upbringing. A lot of, a lot of us have gone through, a, a, you know, amazing our own stories, um, but uh, it, it definitely molded me. There's there's actually a lot of beautiful things that came from it, to be, believe it or not, but it was definitely a challenge and it took me years, actually until about four years ago, to really find my stride in life and reclaim who I am as a woman um, and not be living for everybody else. Sounds like in a way you were, you had to become the adult in that situation, kind of taking care of your mom. And also those, those, those men that you mentioned, were they people that you actually knew? Uh, yes, all family members, all family members. Mm -hmm. One lived in the home with me and the other two uh, didn't, but when they'd come to visit or we'd go to visit them, uh, you know, the sexual abuse would happen. And so, and, I mean, it was, it was, it's such an interesting, sexual abuse is such an interesting thing because sometimes, you know, with two of them, it was violent. It, it was scary. It was, I was, threatened with my life if I told uh, one of my abusers, it actually almost felt like a relationship. I was three years old when it started. So I had no, I was actually always wondering why other people didn't do, like, I thought it was a normal thing. Um, and I actually remember it went on for 10 years. And I remember actually feeling um, jealous when he got into a, a relationship, when he got a girlfriend, I was confused as to why the attention came off of me which is a lot of us who have been through abuse walk around with so much shame about a couple things that, wow, we were getting attention, even though it was horrible attention. Sometimes it was, it was very painful um, emotionally, physically, all the things, but still, you know, you're groomed to, you know, take this attention. And then when the attention's actually turned from you, sometimes you actually get, um, you feel a missing, you feel abandoned. It's so interesting, that side of the abuse that a lot of people don't talk about. And the other piece, I'm very transparent about it, that sometimes it felt good. You know what I mean? Like certain, like when our bodies are touched, that's just the reality is that sometimes it felt good, even though it was so wrong, right? And to this day, I mean, I take such a stand against abuse. Uh, but the reality is a lot of us who have been through abuse you know, certain parts of it might have felt good. And so in our heads, 
we walk around with all this shame about that uh, with the fact that, you know, we, we just don't even want to admit that. And we feel horrible about ourselves because of it. And it's just, you know what, it's just a reality, you know, touch feels good. Some of the abuse felt good. Uh, the, some of the attention felt good. Uh, but no, it was wrong. It was wrong on every level. I take a stand against it. Um, but it is amazing the emotional turmoil that we go through when we when we're abused as children. I think it's really important to acknowledge that as well, isn't it? You know, to mm -hmm. kind of, yeah, just be transparent about that. So um, did your mother have any idea what was going on? Did she just turn a blind eye? Is this turn a blind eye? Out? Right. Mm -hmm. Great question. That's a great question. Um, I've actually never been asked that before, but yes, uh, the, I, I did attempt to tell her a few times um, and I just wasn't sure. I could tell it was, I wasn't sure how wrong it was because I was so young. I think I was five or six when I first started to try to tell her uh, because everything started when I was three, as I mentioned. And um, she, when I just started to say, um, you know, he does, he does kind of some weird things to me. I didn't know how to bring it up. Uh, two, two problems happened was the fact that she said, oh, we don't talk about that. So it was a sweep it under the rug. Her parents swept things under the rug. I believe their parents swept things under the rug just to keep face. So she was in this denial phase. Um, and the other piece of it was she was such an emotional uh creature uh, we'll talk borderlining on um, some mental illness and so when a child brings something up to their mother and they freak out and they absolutely freak out as a child what you're thinking in your own head is I upset mommy I upset mommy and so what I always to teach people or teach parents, if your child comes to you with something, it is so important for you, even as painful as it is to hear, for your child's sake, to let them know that was great that they shared. And so I actually always, so once she swept it under the rug I and she got very upset, I backed off as the child. So it wasn't until maybe five years later, I tried to bring it up again. Same, same concept happened. Um, and then when I was 17, I just came, came out with it. And it was, it was like the whole family abandoned me. You know, everybody was so upset that nobody turned to me and said, are you okay? Uh, everybody just went into their own emotional things. She tried to kill herself. I had to, you know, I mean, it was, it was just a lot of, uh, it, it was not really encouraging me to come out with my story. Um, so, and then the main thing she was worried about was um, that I would share this publicly, <laughs> you know? And she so- Shame the family. I was going to shame the family. And so um, she and I actually don't have a relationship anymore. Uh, and I feel so at peace with that because she's, I set her free. I don't want anything bad for her. Um, but she did come out a couple of years ago and let me know that she did know about the abuse and she turned a blind eye. And that's actually not why I uh, set the relationship free. It was the fact that I was starting to share this on a public forum and she struggled deeply with it. Um, and she said, everybody's going to think badly of me. And um, I actually wasn't sharing about her specifically uh, back then. Um, but it was, it was just, it was so self-focused and she wasn't encouraging me to complete the circle of healing for myself. So that's where a lot of the challenge came from. Um, in that, in telling her was that she got very emotional and it was a sweep it under the rug kind of thing. So it was, uh, it was quite an interesting thing. So as parents, please, I just, I just say be as open as humanly possible. You can cry, you can scream behind closed doors, but not in front of your young child. Yes, absolutely. So you talked about the fact that you became a, a, a people pleaser. What, you know, it, it was that just a way of coping or just a way of getting attention? And, and how did, you know, there's those feelings of low self-worth actually affect the sequence of events that played out next in your life? Absolutely. What a great question. Um, a couple pieces to that. So with the people pleasing side of things, um, you know, I felt like my soul survival depended on one of my um, abusers, um, you know, approving also my mother, right? And so if I did what she wanted, if I was her emotional crutch, if I did everything perfect, she wouldn't lose her crap. You know what I mean? And so I realized that my household would stay a little bit more calm if I did everything right. 
Uh, so that was a piece of it. And then <clears throat> just having an abuser with that emotional tie, I actually um, had something called Stockholm syndrome with my abuser where I was actually protecting, uh, protective of him. Um, and so do you know where Stockholm syndrome comes from? Have you heard of that before? No idea, please explain. I'll, I'll explain that. So basically there was, um, I can't remember uh, what country this was in, but ba uh, Stockholm, <laughs> there we go, we got the name. I take myself back there. <laughs> but um, but basically there were some bank robbers who went into a bank, held people hostage. And you know, so the police were surrounding the building, the bank robbers were holding these people hostage. So it's very fascinating that the hostages then, their lives depended on these bank robbers, right? Were they gonna live or were they gonna die? And their hands were in, their lives were in their hands. And what was interesting was they actually started to get to know the bank robbers a little bit and they formed this unique emotional bond in the point where these, these hostages started to want to protect the bank robbers because and and that's a it's a subconscious thing that happens in our brains uh where we can start to become protective of the person our, of our abuser in a sense and so they named it stockholm syndrome because it's like you're sitting here as a hostage but now and so to the police like the the hostages didn't want the bank robbers to be hurt and so it's really a fascinating that's where it starts from and so so many abusers or abusees the people who are abused uh become protective of their abusers because there's an emotional bond that's created. Um, even as sick and unhealthy as that is, there's this bond that's created between the two. So I actually didn't fully come out strongly about my abuse until the person, my main abuser moved out of the house because I didn't want him to get kicked out of the house. I was protective of him. If you would have asked me up till four years ago, I would have been still saying, oh, he's my favorite person. Oh, he's just my favorite. And I was very protective. We had this secret bond that we couldn't explain to other people. And so until I, and that all came from my low self-worth, my low self-esteem. I had extremely low self-esteem. Um, to the world, I was strong. To the world, I was happy. To the world, I had my life together. Behind closed doors, I was a mess. I was suicidal, uh, attempted suicide a couple times. Um, just, I was so messed up in here that I felt like nobody really understood me. Um, but it's because I couldn't, I was so incongruent. I, I did not know who I was because my identity was based on what everybody else growing up, what else, everybody else placed on me. So, um, so all that to say the people pleasing led to so much turmoil in my life until four years ago when I really, actually five years ago now, until I really dug into my self-worth. And now that's why I teach what I teach. Um, but it led me to being attacked actually in college, which I can dig into. And then it also led into two uh, verbally and physically abusive marriages. And interestingly enough, I have two different second degree black belts. I knew exactly how to get my ex-husband off of me when he would sexually assault me, all those things. Um, but the two pieces of that is my mindset wasn't there for me to protect myself. I was, a, I was not only a people pleaser, but my self-worth people pleasing is just a, a symptom of a low self-worth. So my self-worth was so low, um, that I had the skills to get him off of me, but I didn't think I was worth that. And the other piece that people do not talk about is 80% of the time we're, we're attacked by someone we know. 80%. It's not always the stranger jumping at you in a dark alley. So a lot of self-defense experts out there, a lot of uh, personal safety, what they don't touch on is what what do you do when the person attacking you has a face that you married, that you love, that you, you know, when, when it is somebody on top of you that you have made vows to, you know, it, it's like, do I crush his throat? Do I gouge his eyeballs out? No, I mean, it's it's a whole different mind game that happens um, to this day now, though. If that were to ever happen in a relationship of mine, I will do what it takes to get the person off of me. You know, you shouldn't lay your hands on me. Sorry, sir. You know, even if I've said I loved you. So there's all, I have a whole different perspective on it, but that came from my people pleasing. That came from my low self-worth. So yeah, people pleasing, it's a symptom of that low self-worth. And when we do not understand our own worth, so much in business, in relationship, in life, uh, can just go down this path that we're not intended to be down. And uh, so I encourage that journey, you know, with people across the world.
Absolutely. And and when you were in those marriages, did she, did any of your friends know what was going on? Did you cover that up? You were just still leading this kind of double life. I was leading a double life. And what's so interesting with people pleasers, this is the funny thing, is we become people pleasers so we can, um, you know, get people to like us, right? We want people to like us so badly. What's interesting about it, and you don't think about this, and it doesn't come from a vindictive sense. So it's not like we're jerks walking around or the opposite, but we are manipulators. We are master manipulators as people pleasers because we will do whatever it takes. We'll be a chameleon and we will, in order to manipulate the person into liking us versus just being our authentic self, our authentic self and letting people like us or not, you know, and being okay with that. Um, and so it's really fascinating <laughs> the manipulation that happens. And so I always say you can't really fully trust a people pleaser. Uh, maybe I always call myself a recovered people pleaser, you know. Um, I wasn't really trustworthy fully, not out, of, like I said, not out of being vindictive, um, not like a narcissistic kind of manipulative way. It was just, I wouldn't fully ever tell the truth because I wanted the person to like me so badly that I would just tell them what they wanted to hear. And so with that said, um, I've, I've fooled my family, my friends, everybody in my life, my coworkers into thinking my marriage was amazing. It was shocking to them when I actually came out about the abuse. They, it was shocking. Like they were just so surprised. And the fact that I was putting on this very strong front in, in you know, out in the world, people were like, you would let that happen. You have two second degree black belts. You would let that happen. Like, you know, it was just so incongruent. Um, but it is truly, that was just how low my self-worth was, was that I was willing to fool everybody. And, but behind closed doors, it was nasty. And I, I don't wish that on anybody. It was, it was awful, but that's my past. And I have thrived and I encourage and help support other people to thrive just as well. At that time, did you think, you know, how, how can this be happening? You know, I've had an abusive childhood. I go through one marriage and that's abusive. And now I'm in another one. You know, there must be something, you know, what, what, what was going on? In oh, yes. So, yeah, great question. So much shame. So much um, like I was just feeling like this severe failure. And I, um, you know, I just didn't know. I, I just that's why the suicidal thoughts is like, like, why does this always happen to me? And that's something I speak out about is uh, and really guide people with is pulling themselves out of victim mentality. Here's the fascinating thing. I lived in victim mentality my entire life. You know, like, why me? Why does this happen to me? All this kind of stuff. Look, I'm in another, like, why can't I get relationships together? You know, all this kind of stuff. And what's so fascinating, and, and this is an unpopular thing to say for anybody in victim mentality right now. They don't like to hear this. I didn't like to hear this. But when it comes to victim mentality, we have to really look at ourselves and think, what are we getting out of staying in victim mentality because so many of us like so for me I was in victim mentality the poor me what do we get we get sometimes love and connection pity attention all this kind of thing and so there is an upside yeah. for us to stay in victim mentality right and so what we all we need to do is really take that step back and think okay what am I getting out of being a, a victim okay and bullet point those things out and then you look at those things and say, okay, how can I actually meet these same needs in a resourceful way? Absolutely. How can I meet these? Mm -hmm. And so victim mentality, it's, it's just, there's going to always, it's a form of self-sabotage on the highest regard. And we can get ourselves out of that and still get those same needs met and live a much more fulfilling life. Absolutely. And it's also, you know, if you're in that victim mentality, you're just not taking responsibility for your life. And you also obviously get to, not have to do the things that you don't want to do you know you, it's a great excuse oh I can't do that because you know so um but it's a very subtle thing isn't it Tiffany yeah it's, it's extremely time. it's extremely yeah. subtle yeah people don't you're not self I wasn't self-aware that I was being in victim mentality but the only reason I got into a second abusive marriage was because I was in victim mentality I there's just no way now like I, I have recovered from my people pleasing there's no way I ever look at myself as a victim no matter what happens I'm like okay either what was my role or okay that happened but what can I do I'm very solution oriented 
Uh, what's the next piece of that? What can I learn from that? Uh, you won't catch me even one day in victim mentality. Once in a while, I'm human. I have a day where I'm just like, oh, like, and it's just typically because I'm overwhelmed. I give myself permission to just have a, a crap day. You know what I mean? Shut everything off, maybe eat the junk food. But I actually set a timer on my phone and let myself do some self self-loathing if I need to, because that's just human nature, right? We have those moments, but I actually set a timer on my phone for either the next morning or that evening, depending on what's going on. And when that timer goes off, I have a commitment to myself to say, whoop, victim mentality ceased, I am back on. And so I think there's some really simple little skills and uh, techniques we can do like that to help just snap, a, snap ourselves out of it. That's a really great idea. So I know that I don't know if it's 20 or 22 years ago, you became a, a self-defense educator and it was actually born out of a terrible incident, wasn't it? So tell us about what happened. So not only did you go through all the things you've told us about, but there was something else too. Oh, yes. It, it's interesting. And the reason I was chosen was because of a lot of the things I've already discussed with the, the people pleasing and uh, lack of self-worth. So uh, back in college, 22 years ago, um, I was at a friend's house, an acquaintance's house, and there was about, there was 12 of us there, and we were, it was very tame, um, we were there in this person's house, the parents weren't home, and uh, we were sitting there just having a couple of beers and some appetizers and things like that, so it was really just us sitting around on the couches talking, and there's two parts to this. And so the first part, we were sitting there on the couch and this is in the farmlands of Wisconsin. <laughs> so no, you know, it's just a lot of space between houses. So um, just to paint the picture a little bit. So we're sitting on these couches and all of a sudden a big smash happens and we all jump and turn around and look. And some man, a man, a random person had walked in the house, smashed the door wide open and just walked in like he owned the place. And the thing about that for me in that very second was that I did not know uh, who belonged there because this was an acquaintance's house. So I thought maybe that was the brother coming home. I had no idea. Uh, like maybe the brother was angry, you know, and he smashed in the door. Um, the door was unlocked. Okay. So he, this man just walked right in about six foot four guy, big old oversized sweatshirt, um, clearly on drugs. So you could just tell it wasn't drunk stupor. It was, he was in another world. So he walks in, literally doesn't stop, doesn't skip a beat. And he walks around the couch, skips all my friends and just lands on me. He just literally plopped on me and he started licking my neck. His hand went down my shirt and he just started accosting me right then and there. And the interesting thing is nobody moved. And this is one of the reasons I teach so much about the mindset and how to overcome your own fear response, because every single person in the room panicked. And the crazy part is one of them was my good friend who was a fourth degree black belt at the time, had all the skills in the world, but he had never done, this is what's missing in the self-defense world is the mindset piece. Um, so anyway, this guy is on top of me and nobody's helping. Nobody's jumping up to pull this guy off of me. So I, I go into my solution mode and I just open-handedly just tapped him back real gently. And I could just kind of leaned back a little bit. And I said, Hey, look, guy, it doesn't seem like anybody knows you here, but we have a ton of beer and food and we can send you on your way with, I didn't say care package, but I basically said with a care package, you know, and the craziest part was he actually took us up on that part. So he, we filled this plate with food. He shoved a whole bunch of beers in his pockets and he literally walked out the house, out of the house, like you leave grandma's house, like your Nana's house where, you know, it was just like, what is happening? And so we go and shut the door, we lock it, we go lock all the doors. And somebody said to the, the kid who lived there, um, somebody said, we should go check all the windows too. And he said, no, we live on a, on a one story and we never unlock or open our windows. And we didn't check. So that was the first part of, if you want to consider that part of the attack, right? So then um, being the kiddos that we were at the time, we did not call the police. I don't know why to this day we didn't, but we did not involve the police. We just sat there and we were just so overwhelmed with shock with it. And we just thought, thank goodness we got him out of the house. We thought it was over. And I don't know why we didn't call, but that's what we do. 
um, only, I think it's only 12% of abuse is actually reported to the police. And as far as crimes go, it's a very low percentage. So that we we fell into that category. So then um, probably a half hour to an hour later, there's the living room, a long hallway and the kitchen. So I'm walking from the living room where everybody was with the music, walking down the hallway to go to the kitchen. And all of a sudden there's a bathroom there. All of a sudden these hands reach out grab me and pull me in aggressively and shut the door and start immediately smashing me up against the door. And it was him. He had snuck back in and he pulled me in and he started brutally attacking me, like just smashing me as hard as he could. And I was, I'm short, I'm five four. He picked me up and had me just like you see in the movies. Um, his hands were grabbing my arms so tightly that his fingers were literally inside my skin. Like he was aggressive. He was telling me he was going to um, rape me, sexually assault me and murder me and then find my family and kill them too. So those were the things that were coming out of his mouth. Um, what was so fascinating was that two weeks before I was in a kickboxing class, I was trying to lose some weight back then and get, get in shape. Um, and it was in a martial arts facility, you know, where you learn self-defense. And so we're sitting there at the end of class stretching and the owner of the martial arts facility came in and said, Hey, do you guys want to see just a few self-defense moves? And yes, yes, I do. You know, so this was two weeks before. So he showed us three moves. He showed us three simple concepts. I never practiced them. I only saw them, but I was thinking two things when I was being attacked. I was thinking I have to stay conscious because he was hitting my head so hard in the back of my head and I was going really lightheaded and black, almost blacking out. So I just kept thinking and, and pulling myself to stay conscious. And the other thing was that, oh my gosh, I learned three self-defense moves two weeks before. I mean, I have to try them. So I did those exact three concepts in the right order and it ended up breaking his nose his head snapped back to the point where he lost his balance and I was able to get out of the bathroom. And my friend happened to be walking up the hallway and saw the blood and he said, oh my gosh, what's happening? And I said, he's in here. So he came and held the door closed um, and we called the police and the police came and uh, it ended up that this, this I almost say gentleman, he's not a gentleman. Uh, this man uh, was wanted for two rapes and an attempted homicide. And so he was the real deal. He went off to prison and I had my life to, you know, to, I was hurting, but I was not hurt, hurt. You know what I mean? Um, and then the most interesting part about it all was that the police officer, after they got him in the um, the police car, he came back in and said, I need to tell you something. They took my statement, all the things, but he said, I need to tell you something. And I said, what's that? And he said, he chose you out of everybody there. And I said, what do you mean? How did he choose me? I was just walking by the bathroom, but it did make sense. Cause when he walked in the front door, he just passed everybody and came right over to me. But he had been watching us from outside the house through the window for 30, 60 minutes, somewhere in that time range. And he chose me and what he, the police officer said, why did you choose her? And he said, she was definitely the easiest target um, because she didn't look like she was gonna put, put up a fight. And I was like, what is that, what? You know what I mean? And I was not, definitely not the most attractive person there. I was um, struggling with my self-worth and I was the acquaintance that came to this house. Everybody knew each other except for me. So I was the people pleaser like, hi, did it, did. I was just kind of meek. I was giving off a vibe that I was meek. And he, he picked up on that, that I was the weakest link emotionally speaking in the room. Um, and that jumped me into studying the field of victimology and understanding how attackers choose their victims in the first place, because we need to understand how they're targeting people. And that's one of the things I educate on is a couple things you can do to not be targeted. So that is the story in a nutshell. I believe he's still in prison. I actually personally don't follow that because I became paranoid for two years after that, thinking everybody's out to get me until I really did a lot of self-work around that and healing. Um, but that's what got me diving into not only the field of victimology, but also self-defense. I wanted to understand the skills. So I went on to get my two different second degree black belts and I've been educating on it ever since. How terrifying. And it sounds like that, well, those three moves literally saved your life. And it was just as simple as just someone demonstrating them at your class 
Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And never even practicing, practicing it. There's so much that we can learn conceptually mm -hmm. uh, that can still save our lives, even if you're not practicing. That's one of the things I really try uh, very hard to get into ha the hands of people around the world uh, because we don't need to be necessarily in a martial arts facility, you know, practicing constantly. That helps to be able to practice like that. But there are so many things that we can use uh, physically and conceptually to help save our lives or get ourselves out of a sticky situation. And the simpler the better, really, isn't it? You know, one hundred percent. Want something that's quick, simple, it's effective. Done. Um, up until today, when I looked up statistics around um, attacks and um, you know the the abuse that goes on around the world. I had no idea to what extreme um, it goes on. Mm. It goes on, but not to, so. Can you speak a little bit about some of those statistics, and also how you how you reach out to women and and educate them? How do you do that? Absolutely. Well, the statistics as they sit today is one in three women will be attacked in their lifetime. That's astronomical. It's so high. Uh, children are, um, I, I don't know the exact statistics, but it's, it's I believe one in three, one in two um, with regards to abuse. And then uh, men, it's one in nine men will be attacked. And it's really interesting how um, those statistics are on the rise. And especially since this pandemic has started, uh, domestic violence has skyrocketed. So it's, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to be able to, um, you know, walk around in life. And I, I never, ever teach fear-based. I never want people to be paranoid because guess what? That's who they target is the people who look like they're in fear, who look paranoid, who, you know, so we actually, just because those statistics are what they are, all we want to use those is as a, to shine a light on the need for us to just learn this crucial life skill. And I wish with my whole heart and soul that this was taught in school, that this was a life skill that we were taught as we went through school because uh, it's, a, it's a need. It's a need way more than, you know, calculus, <laughs> you know, or whatever we're learning, right? Um, and so the, the way I teach it, so I, I have taught, you know, I used to teach in person, but what I was very drawn to was helping women, uh, men also, and children around the entire world to have access to self-defense because there's so many of us that will not go into a martial arts facility. It's just either not our style, we don't have time for it, there's busy moms, moms, uh, you know, around the world, or women who just don't have access to self-defense. Um, you know, South Africa, India, the, the statistics of attacks on women and, and wives, domestic violence as well, are so high and they're not encouraged or don't even have access to be able to go into a self-defense facility. So I developed an online platform to help women. So I took my 22 years of knowledge of not only just the physical self-defense, that's a big piece of it, but also the situational awareness, how to properly set a boundary, the self-defense tools that are legal in your country, um, those types of things. If they are illegal, I talked about, I talk about some options, but there's so much to personal safety. So there's self-defense, which is the self-defense skills, the physical stuff, but then there is the personal safety aspect. So I have a course that I have put out to the world. Um, and sometimes I'll, you know, it, I, I put that out there. Women go through that all the time, but also, um, you know, I do, uh, you, you know what book clubs are, right? Where women to get together, they read a book and then they have a, a meeting to talk about it. I actually do that type of thing where a group of women will go through the course together and I come on and do Zoom um, extra training, answer questions, all that kind of stuff. So we actually do it together. So it's fun. I try to make it fun and entertaining and light. And I teach in my heels because first of all, I was wearing heels when I was attacked high heels. Um, so I teach you to actually use those as a tool. So I want, I wanted to meet women where they're at in life. You know, the busy mom, the whoever that can't get into a facility or just doesn't want to, I wanted to meet you in your home so you can sit at your computer on your phone and actually learn these skills. Uh, so you don't have to, so we can actually turn those statistics around the one in three women. It's, it's, I wish it was zero, but the reality is the attackers are still going to attack. It's up to us to empower ourselves to know what to do about it if we're ever faced with somebody like that. 
absolutely. And I will post all your links below this video, but I've just got to ask you, have you got some simple tips right now that you can give us that, you know, will have us, you know, in, in some way be able to defend ourselves should something Absolutely. happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have 22 years of tips up in this brain of mine. <laughs> so one, one of my favorite concepts to teach is high, low or low, high. So think about this. Let's just say you want to um, strike some, a, a man in the groin. Okay. So if you want to kick him in the groin, well, first of all, and this is where I get into the myths about groin strikes. First of all, they know that that's where we want to target, right? That they are aware of that. Um, every seminar where I'm speaking to thousands of women in the audience and I say, where's the first place you'd want to strike on a man? Everybody in the groin, you know, and, and it's just one of those things, right? So men are expecting it, but also they're wired to protect that area, right? So we never, so let's say my plan is to strike low, strike on the, strike to the groin, right? I don't want to start my tactic there. I don't want to start my technique there. So actually I would want to distract him somewhere high, right? So maybe I, I do a palm strike to the nose or a throat strike to the upper throat, not down here. We have a lot of muscles that we want to go up at an angle because that's where it's most vulnerable on the throat. So we want to strike and always pull back right away. I'll explain that in a second, but we would want to do something on the upper body because what does that do? It brings their hands up, right? It has their natural instincts to lean back and try to avoid whatever's coming at them. Well, what does that open up? Their groin, right? Because they're not protecting it. So what the, you want to distract high, even if your technique lands, but you want to distract high and then strike low to you know get their brain and their body in a position that helps you to be effective with that groin strike. You can do the opposite where you kick to the groin, you know, or kick or stomp on the knee, whatever it is, something on the lower half. And what's going to happen is their hands come down and they lean forward and it opens up their whole face where all the sensitive areas are, right? Their eyes, their nose, their ears, you can box somebody's ears, go, go at the throat. So if you want, if in your head, you want to strike on the face or neck somewhere, you want to distract low and then strike high. And the other piece of that, is this is where a lot of women specifically will go into panic mode if their first strike doesn't land. I want, I want to implore you to expect to miss one, twice, three times because human nature is to have, you know, he's going to try to protect himself. And I say he, by the way, for the attacker, women attack too. I just say he for simplicity purposes. But um, so let's just say you wanted to, you strike in the groin to distract him and then you come up for a throat strike. Well, human nature tells you that he might turn his head, right? He's going to see it coming on some level and he might turn his head. So you might miss, right? But what does human nature also tell you? He's going to look back at you. There's no way he's going to keep his head turned and continue the fight like that, right? He's going to look back at you. You can expect it. So what you want to do is you strike and you might miss, you might hit, right? But let's say you miss, he turns his head. I want you to pull your hand back immediately knowing he's going to look back at you and your second strike is going as he's starting to look back. Okay. So you can expect to miss a couple of times. A lot of women, what they'll do, I've, I've spoken to hundreds of thousands of women um, over the years that I've educated. And I hear so many stories and they said, I, I learned a self-defense technique and I used it and it missed. And I went into panic mode and then I got sexually assaulted something a lot. That's a story I hear so many times. And I said, if I had told you expect to miss and, you know, pull your arm back so you're prepared for the next one. And if it's not working high, then go low. And if it's not working low, then go high. And she said that would have saved her. That would have saved her because it was her mindset. And she literally stopped fighting after she, she just kind of gave in to the attacker um, because she was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And she just gave in. And so um, it's one of those things that in our minds, we can't go into panic mode. That's one of the ways I teach women to overcome their own fear response is by uh, just planning these things, expecting it. So if you miss, it's okay, got, you got it. What's your next technique? What's your next play kind of thing? So um, so that's it. That's one of the, I love the high, low, low, high concept because it can apply to any type of strike, anything. You just want to, it's, it's physics and it's um, manipulating their body the way you need it to be. Brilliant strategy. I, I can definitely remember that. But also, um, presumably you'll bring your, your hand back again so you, 
you've got more power when you when you surge forward and make that move again and and yes. this time hit yeah yes so does it actually hurt does it hurt to actually make the move so i love that question because the one technique I actually don't teach that is the most I, I, I encourage not people not to do um, is but it's the most common technique that we all turn to is a punch is a closed fist punch because that can break your fingers sometimes it will hurt you way more than it hurts the person and we've all seen those movies uh, you know in the movies where somebody punches and then the person takes it and then they kind of shake it off and keep coming right we see that all the time but when you throat strike up into somebody and actually crush their windpipe. I mean, I'm talking, this is like a real attacker where you need to take dire um, steps. Uh, you, you crush their windpipe kind of thing. Um, you know, that is, this is so much more vulnerable versus you punching them in the face or something like that. So punches actually tend to hurt you more than they hurt the person, unless you strike just right. Um, the neck, punching the neck is actually way more effective than punching the face. Because this, we have so many nerve endings in here that can actually cause somebody to pass out. But you have to do it right. You have to strike properly. So I actually say don't punch because it tends to hurt you more. An open hand strike, um, it really, it, it, it might be a little uncomfortable for sure, especially if you strike as hard as you can, you wanna get your thumb out of the way. You don't wanna break your own thumb. So you want to come in with a, like a V hand. Um, and really um, one of the things I teach is flex. Like you should feel your muscles all the way up to your elbow engaging. So you are like a strong, strong. Oh, I can feel it in my arm right now. Uh -huh. Yeah. So no self-defense works with a floppy hand. That's what I say. But yeah, so it, it can, um, you know what, it can cause maybe a little discomfort if you strike somebody, if you, you know, go at their face like that. Um, but honestly, you're going to, you're going to, it might just have some small bruises compared to something yeah, worse that could happen. Absolutely. What if they've got a weapon? So if they have a weapon, it's, it's a whole different scenario two things, uh, two things to think about with weapons. So let's say somebody has a knife, okay, and they come yielding a knife. Very interesting, and this is where research comes into play, is if somebody, and this is going to sound a little scary, so I'm just going to, uh, but I, I'm very straightforward with things. If somebody really, really wants to use that knife on you, they're going to actually conceal it until they get right up to you, okay? And then they're going to almost out of your eyesight start using it on you. Um, because if they really, really want to use it, they don't want to put it out there for you to see, right? So all, I, I'm not going to say always, and I can't do it guarantees, of course, but if somebody comes up to you and shows you the knife, shows you the knife and threatens you with it, almost always they're using it just as a scare tactic. They're using it as a threat unless things escalate, right? So if somebody comes up to you and they're yielding a knife and they want your property, they want your purse, they want your wallet, um, give them those things, give them those things, give them those things because those things are replaceable, you are not, okay? So if somebody's actually showing you the knife and kind of doing this big swing thing going on, that's actually not an effective way to use a knife. Um, and so you can kind of know that they're an amateur or they're just using it as a threat kind of thing. Uh, so the other piece of, you know, if they really wanted to use that knife on you, for example, um, they are going to conceal it most often. They're going to conceal it as they come up to you. Um, it's, it's very interesting and I have never been stabbed myself, so I cannot speak to this. However, I have interviewed so many people who have been and they say, I didn't even feel the first one to five stabs because it, it's so quick and your brain doesn't pick up on that pain immediately until you like, you know, sometimes they start feeling it or they actually just see blood, right? Um, so then I actually teach physical techniques. I would actually have to vi visually show you. That's the stuff I teach in my course is how to handle, how to physically handle a knife, a gun, a bat being swung at you. Side note, if somebody's swinging a stick or a bat at you, the last four inches is the most uh, dangerous part. So I would either rather you get out of the way, uh, of course, or move into the person and grab their arm kind of thing. So you want to stop and block uh, versus let that last four inches of the bat swing and hit you because that's what will, um, you know, render you unconscious kind of thing. So, but yeah, with regards to knives or, or, or guns in general, this is the other piece that I was going to touch on is um, 
you always want your hands close to the weapon. So let's say somebody's putting a gun up towards your face, okay? You always wanna look like you're surrendering, right? So hands up and you look like you're surrendering because the only reason somebody puts a gun in your face is because they want to be more powerful than you and significant in your life all of a sudden, right? Well, you allow them to be significant and powerful, okay? So you say, I'm, you know, what, what do you want? I have money in the other room, you're like whatever. So you look like you're surrendering. And then that's what I teach in my course as well is then how to actually disarm that weapon and, and face it back towards them. You have to understand how to use a gun. I know in the UK, they're illegal, right? Um, so, but in, in America, for any of your listeners uh, in where guns are, are legal, even if you're anti-gun, you still need to understand how to use it because if you disarm that weapon, and then you're holding it and have no idea what to do with it, they're just going to overcome you and get it back. So it's really important to at least understand the basics. So you could even watch YouTube, you know, to understand how to do that. Uh, so I encourage that strongly. The last piece, I'm sorry I'm talking so much, but this is so important, is if somebody, if I were ever in a situation where somebody had a knife or a gun, I would not make a move on that weapon unless three things. I really, really thought that they were going to use that weapon on me, right? Um, the second thing is if they were using that weapon to get me into a vehicle to take me to a secondary location. Those are really the two main things. Otherwise, what you want to do is try to actually talk yourself out of the situation. So just because I'm a self-defense expert and I know how to disarm weapons, it's the last thing I would turn to. I would actually use, I always say your mind is your most powerful weapon. There is so much we can do verbally to de-escalate de situations, to you know talk people off the ledge if, if they're willing to hear, um, and to talk ourselves out of a situation. I will always start with my verbal self-defense, my verbal self-defense over physical self-defense anytime when there's a weapon involved. Wow, that, that's just absolute gold, those tips. Thank you so much. So now, it, it's obvious, Tiffany, that you are incredibly passionate about what you do. I mean, when you, when you started doing what you do, you were on a mission, weren't you? And I know you're still on a mission. And I think you probably taught about 60,000 women or something crazy. Um, so do you feel as passionate about it now, all those years on, as you did when you started? You know, I have never been asked that question. What a high quality question that is. You know, I will say I was passionate for a different reason at the beginning because I wanted to get into self-defense because I never wanted to go through that again. I wanted to understand more. It was more self-focused for me to learn the mindset piece, learn how to not be paranoid, learn the physical techniques. So for the first several years of my journey, I was teaching other people, but I was really still in the process of understanding, learning. Um, you know, I studied two different types of martial arts and they specialize in things, right? But if with the two martial arts, the self-defense I studied, if they got me to the ground, I wouldn't have known what to do. And so I went over my years and have studied so many different types of self-defense to pull the best of the best from each form because I, I just didn't understand. I, I didn't feel very congruent just teaching just these two, you know? It's not just like, hey, blocking like this. It's not like that. We have to understand street smart self-defense. So in that, I became more and more passionate over the years to, you know, uh, of educating other people, men, women, children. Um, but I was more in my local area, right? Doing that. So it was originally about me learning. Then I started uh, teaching people locally. And it was in the last three years that I thought, I have so much knowledge up here that I need to get out to the world. So that's why I created the online platform and my, my actual own self-defense business. I went full time with it um, to get this mission out to the world and speak, uh, you know, speak to big crowds, do this through an online platform and things like that. So yes, my mission now, especially after teaching, it's actually been well over a hundred thousand people at this point. Um, I hear story after story after story and every story I hear just lights my mission even stronger. It lights that fire under me to get this out there. Uh, so my mission has actually grown every single story I've heard, every single year I've been at it, um, enough for me to leave a very, very good paying job to really focus on this full time. It's, it's such a passion of mine. <laughs> good mm -hmm. question. 
So when you're no longer on this planet, Tiffany, how would you like to be remembered? You know, I would like to be remembered uh, in two ways with the women who, the woman who brought personal safety into the homes of anybody around the world. So giving access where previously access wasn't granted um, to women. Um, I just, I have so many stories, a woman in India who, you know, wasn't allowed to go to self-defense. She was assaulted four times uh, by five or four different men and a fifth man came to her and uh, she had watched some of my videos and she was able to put him down and get herself to safety for the first time in her life. Her family had shunned her because she was impure after the first four attacks. It was horrifying to me, the mental struggle that this woman went through. And then to watch her feel so self-empowered after watching these videos and taking matters into her own hands. She, I, I want to be remembered for not only teaching people how to physically defend themselves, but that empowerment piece of understanding it's okay to take stand for yourself and it's needed and that you can be your own best advocate. So I just, that, that's, that's it. That's what I want to be known for is the empowerment side of personal safety to really shift ourselves into our own self-worth and honestly, just to lead these lives where we can step into the best versions of ourselves so we can make an impact on the world. Amazing. So before we close, is there anything else you'd like to say? You know, uh, just any of your listeners who are feeling like they're at a stop in life, so much of that self-sabotage, so much of that procrastination, so much of that fear of moving forward, it just stems from some simple, um, simple fears that we can break through so quickly. And so much of that just starts with our own self-worth. So, you know, anybody who's still sitting in an abusive relationship and thinking there's no way out or I don't deserve to be out of this kind of thing, I just implore your listeners to take that wherever they are in life and to be able to up-level themselves. It starts with that belief in yourself and doing, taking some action on your own self-worth, being proactive about your own self-worth. It's it's amazing what unveils itself in your life when you actually focus on that. So I just, I love that. And then I adore you. I love what you're doing. I love your mission. Um, I love, I love the companies you work with. I just love everything you stand for. And I just, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing what you do because you are bringing on the most amazing guests. And um, I just, I just love you. Thank you for your mission. I was just going to say exactly the same about you. I mean, oh. honestly, I mean, what gems and, you know, what courage, um, you know, you've had to have to experience what you've experienced and to be where you are today and to make such a massive impact on the planet. Um, I'm just truly grateful for what you do and the difference that you make in the world. So Tiffany Armstrong, thank you so very much. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me.